But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. It's a time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish this out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. Uh, Father, we pray for our friends in Israel that are under duress, and we pray for the families that are affected. Uh, we pray for the Israeli military as they defend freedom in Israel. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read to you in the English... 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. We're going to pick up another subject. We picked up unlimited atonement out of the first part of this verse. And we're going to pick up another subject in the second half. It says here, Who desires, that is God, all men to be saved. And so God has allowed through the cross of Jesus Christ salvation for every member of the human race. The question is, do you believe? What do you think of Jesus Christ? Is he a carpenter? Is he just a good man? Is he a prophet? Or is he the savior of the world? You'll have to answer that yourself. And it's between you and God. It says here, Who desires all men to be saved? And that word saved is the word sozo. It's in the aorist tense. That means in one moment of time when you believe. The passive voice, that means you receive the action of the verb. You don't do anything, you receive it as a free gift. The infinitive mood. And, second half of the verse, to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so God leaves us on earth after salvation for a purpose. And that is to come to the full knowledge of the truth. I wanted to share with you a little bit of Greek here from this verse because we're going to get a little more understanding when we look at it. When you see the word to come here, it's the aorist active infinitive of erkomai. And let's see if I can move that. The word can mean to come or to go. Here it means to advance. The aorist tense is a cumulative aorist, which views the action of the verb or following the colors to supergrace and establishing a command post in its entirety. But it regards it from the viewpoint of its existing results. The existing results are emphasized in the cumulative aorist, which means reaching maturity is the great objective, which becomes the result. Reaching maturity or super grace as the tactical victory in the angelic conflict. The active voice here, though, means the believer produces the action of the verb by consistent positive volition towards doctrine. The infinitive is the infinitive of purpose. It should be translated and to advance. And so differing from the when you had salvation, Sozo, you had the passive voice, didn't you? You received the action of the verb. It was a salvation's a free gift from God. Uh, we simply believe in Christ. We accept Him as our Savior, and boom, God imputes His eternal life to us, and uh, we're saved. But the second half of this verse includes you doing something here, and it is Bible study. It is the advance to super grace. And so you have the infinitive of purpose, active voice. That means you produce the action of the verb. And then the next word or phrase is unto the knowledge. It's ice plus the accusative singular of epinosis, which is translated full knowledge. So tonight... We're going to take a look at the doctrine of gap. It's the second half of our verse, and it is the answer to why you are alive. Why did you? Why did God leave you here after salvation? Why did He not snatch you right into heaven 
the moment you believed in Christ and get us out of this mess. And the truth is, He wants to grow you up and He's going to do that through His Word. So the doctrine of gap. You'll notice that the uh, word gap is all in caps. That's because it's an acrostic. And the acrostic stands for grace apparatus for perception it's how we learn the word of god i've got an introduction for you though and i want to share a few points before we begin the doctrine of gap we should know that god is perfectly fair that means he's perfect justice and that means he has designed a system so that every believer in the church age has the ability to advance. In other words, there is no excuse for you not to because God has provided, provided the means for every one of us to learn his word. In other words, none of us is... Uh, handicapped in any kind of way when it comes to learning mystery doctrine. And so, God in perfect justice designed a system so that every one of us could learn. This means that no facet of mystery doctrine is hidden to those who seek the truth. If you want it, God will reveal it to you. If you don't want it, He will not reveal it to you. Now, I want you to uh, recognize I've pulled up a certain category of truth here, mystery doctrine, because we are in the church age, and mystery doctrine is our category of truth. God's not going to hold you accountable for not knowing uh, how old Methuselah was. He's not going to hold you accountable for not knowing who Mephibosheth was. He's not going to hold you accountable for not uh, knowing, uh, you know, how many wives David had. And so... The idea is, is that the church age believer is accountable to know the mystery doctrine of the church age, and that is our rules for living in the church age. And while the Bible has 66 books, we're mainly accountable for what's in the New Testament. So then, God's system does not reward the brilliant or the scholarly but those who don't give up. The plugger, the plotter, the one who is consistent. I sat beside a guy at, the, at lunch when we were down at the Shreveport Bible Conference and he, you know, <laughs> the subject came up and I said, yeah, I'm a pastor from Arkansas. And he said, well, yeah, oh, I hit share again. Not that one. Not that one. Yeah. The subject came up and he said, Well, what uh, seminary did you go to? And I said, I gapped it to the top. And he he didn't he didn't it took him a couple of seconds. He he looked over and he, he smiled at me. He said, Amen, brother. He didn't say amen, but he, he gave me the fist bump. I've seen more pastors turn into idiots going to a organized institution than they ever would have taken. They could have sat down and listened to tapes and saluted the colonel every day and, uh, and kept on listening. They wouldn't have got so mixed up. And uh, there's even a lot of pastor teachers who put away the colonel's information after they after they used the colonel's information to solidify themselves in ministry, they stopped studying from him, and then they veered off the path, and they got way out there in the Thule's and got mixed up. And so uh, I thoroughly, I'm, I, he's, 
Colonel Theme is the only pastor teacher that I recognize as my right pastor. I've got a ton of his information. I've got his literature. I've got his exegesis. I've got his thumb drive. I've got everything you can imagine from him. And yes, there are places where uh, things may have changed and there's been some things brought to light, but it's been more of a multiplication of what he gave than it was a subtraction or a division. And so um, I am proud to say I have never been to seminary and I truly believe that the content of what we teach in this building is probably deeper than what you can get just about anywhere in Clark County, I would imagine, um, in the surrounding area. And this, this point comes true to me. You study the Word of God and you stick with it. You don't have to be a scholar. And you don't have to be brilliant. What you've got to be is consistent. And you stick with it and you keep learning and you grind it out. And if you can't get a hold of it, you keep tugging and you keep digging and you keep trying and you, you'll grasp it if you just stick with it. And uh, that's what the Word of God is going to teach us about gap. And then, finally... We should uh, recognize this is quite the opposite of what the world, the, the direction the world is going now. People can't wait to label you as insufficient in this world. In other words, they would love to interview you and tell you why you're not going to succeed. And uh, our government is the world's worst on wanting to try to label people as less than uh, successful, and this is why. And um, it's so bad, I don't know if you know it, but it is so bad in America that people will act, they act crazy or try to act mentally handicapped so that they can get a check from the government. And I know people that do it. And they will go in and they will try to act like an invalid in order to qualify for some type of government provision. And so they're in, in this world, they're winning by acting dumb. Can you get it? It's not going to work out for them at Bema. It's quite the opposite. God has extended to every believer of the church age, the ability to learn the full realm of mystery doctrine. And so acting dumb won't get you anywhere with God. And that's what the grace apparatus for perception is. It just simply means if you want to learn, God has provided the means to do so. So let's take a look at the doctrine of gap. Point number one, the acrostic. What does it stand for? First, grace. It means we didn't earn it and we don't deserve it, but God gave it to us. He gave us a whole package. In the old church I was in, I used to think I used to talk about God growing the pine trees that were in the uh rafters in the ceilings and he watered those trees and made sure they had the right nutrients and they gave them the right amount of sun and the good old red clay dirt in Arkansas and here you are under a building in the dry and protected and you can learn the word of God that's part of God's grace package but I think this ceiling has maybe metal two by fours in it or that structural two by four stuff they use so I'm gonna have to come up with a new teaching on that but Every from, everything from the oxygen that you're breathing, the food that's converted to sugar that goes to your brain so you can think, uh, the water you drink is all part of the grace package for you to learn. And uh, if you don't, 
think that we're sustained by grace, you just let the, the sun stop shining for a little while. Let the rain stop falling for a little while and you just see. God's grace sustains us. And in the Jewish age, he made the Jews stop working one day a week just to remember that. Hey, it's God's grace that's keeping you alive. And so, grace... God gave us the whole package to learn doctrine. We didn't earn it or deserve it. Apparatus, this means there are some mechanics involved. There are spiritual mechanics. It's a system. The Bible is the only book that outlines the mechanics of a man's soul. And... <clears throat> I think it's interesting because obviously God made souls, but incorporated a lot of spiritual mechanics into his word so that we could actually understand how the human soul works. And then P is for perception. It means to understand, to know, to be cognizant. We have a contractor at our building right now adding on to our shop, and he's a believer. And I said, you know, he, he gets really emotional, kind of excited. And I said, we're talking about Israel and everything's going over there, on over there right now. And I said, yeah, you know. Well, and he was talking, we was talking about things happening in the world. I said, you know, it, the historical trends that are happening right now could lead us right into the rapture. The things that are going on. And, uh, do you know what the opposite of perception is? Uh, a term that might be used might be strong delusion. There are a lot of people under strong delusion. And it says that God gave them uh, he gives them over to strong delusion. In other words, if they resist the truth, they fall into the lie. And uh, there's going to be myriads of people who walk right into the tribulation knowing nothing about what's fixing to happen because they've resisted the Word of God. And uh, isn't it amazing that a lot of uh, what happens in the tribulation is outlined in the Bible? So we're perceptive to truth. We want it. We can understand it. The difference between human IQ and spiritual IQ is the subject of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to, uh, I'm going to read from verse uh, 6 on over to about 13. 1 Corinthians 2, 6. Paul says, However we speak or communicate wisdom, Sophia, among those who are mature, that's mature, that's spiritual, spiritually mature Christians, yet not the wisdom of this age, not Sophia, not philosophy of this age, nor the rulers of this age. That means not political philosophy. Who are coming to nothing. I like that. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. That's a mystery doctrine. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. That means mystery doctrine pre-existed the human race. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, nor have entered into the right lobe of man, the things which God has prepared, and that word prepared is hetoi modzo, 
It means to make way for a king. It means to roll out the red carpet. Prepared for those who love him. That means they've reached gates five and six, divine dinosphere. But, verse 10, God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit, it searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, cosmo, cosmos, but the Spirit is, who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God, His grace package. These things we also communicate, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, that's vocabulary. But which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual with spiritual. That's frame of reference. I might as well see. Go on to verse 14. It says, The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's the unbeliever. For they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them. See, he doesn't have the grace package. For they are spiritually discerned. He doesn't have a human spirit regenerated at the moment of salvation. And he does not have the Holy Spirit indwelling that human spirit. Verse 15 is cool, though. Watch this. But he who is spiritual, that means the believer in fellowship, judges or discerns all things. That means he has discernment in life. Yet he himself is rightly discerned by no one. That means he may do things that nobody else understands, but he's being led by the Spirit, and therefore he is supposed to be doing those things, just like me standing right here right now. Verse 16, But who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? Paul says, But we have the mind of Christ. And Paul spent much time learning the mind of Christ, and giving it to us. He goes on in chapter 3 and says, And I, brethren, that means born-again believers, could not communicate to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal. They were born again, but they had unconfessed sin in their life. As to babes in Christ. In other words, the carnal believer can only handle milk. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, or you're still carnal. Or where there are envy, strife. Remember sour grapes? We're studying on Sunday morning. Envy, strife, and divisions among you. Are you not carnal and behaving like unbelievers, mere men? So we see that the spiritual believer has a spiritual IQ he receives from God, and let's go, I'm going to preach my way into point two if I don't watch it. The human IQ is never a factor in the function of gap. Otherwise, God would be unfair. Low human IQ is never a handicap in learning doctrine. For this reason, every believer in the church age has received all the grace, help necessary. That's the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit and the activation of the human spirit at the moment of salvation. And thirdly, a right pastor teacher to communicate Bible doctrine. Three items. All grace. None of them, none of them cost you a thing. It's all free. The question is, do you want it? And uh, I think Caleb and Joshua marching across the desert and being two out of two million are the, uh, the mathematics behind that is probably about right for believers that actually want to learn and grow most want to have a religious experience. They want to have an emotional deal. They want to 
um, you know, have a social life at church, so on and so forth. Very few, I think, really want to get down to the nuts and bolts of the thing and learn and grow up. I think very few actually want to do that. So here are some left lobe mechanics. Left lobe mechanics. First of all, the Bible says, Forsake not the assembling of the saints. And I think in person is best. For one thing, I can look you right in the eye and I can tell if you're getting it. And then uh, there's been a few occasions where well, people wandered into the building for some other reason rather than to learn and they became distractions. And then uh, that's when a pastor can dismiss that person. And so a lot of times I can look out in the auditorium and I can tell if somebody is there for the wrong reason. And I can, most of the time, I can figure out how to make them mad enough to leave without telling them to. And uh, that's good because if you don't, Paul says, I travail in childbirth again until Christ be formed in you. And while we're, we're always happy to see new people come in, look, the effort of this ministry is to grow them up. And there's a lot, there's a lot of grinding, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of salt hauling that has to go on in order to feed a congregation to make them grow up. And that's what Paul, he's saying, I've got birth pains when somebody new walks in the door. So you assemble yourselves. Now, we have made the provision for you to assemble yourselves on Zoom and YouTube. And I'm not so sure that it's not detrimental, somewhat detrimental. Because you don't, you don't have to sit and listen and I don't get to stare you right in your beady eyes and see if you're staying awake. You're rubbing Dorito fingers on your shirt. You got the party bag full of Doritos and you got fingerprints right here. But I will say this. If you can't make it in person, we're going to keep on doing Zoom and we're going to keep on doing YouTube because it is the second best option. And uh, I still love to see you all out there. I still love to see your names on the internet. I still uh, love to, to know that you're out there listening. And so you can assemble yourselves online. And that, I believe, it's still part of the process. Secondly, there has to be some amount of respect. If you're going to learn something, you have to respect I believe you ought to respect where the Word of God's being communicated. It's called the local church. You need to be able to have some respect for the one communicating, the pastor. And believe it or not, this is my hometown. There are some people who can't respect me. The Bible even says the prophet's not accepted in his hometown. Jesus didn't preach in his hometown. There's some people that know me as a little squirt kid. The little brat. They can't respect me. So look, don't waste your time. Find a pastor you can salute. Because when it comes to the Word of God, he's your authority. Got to be some kind of respect. Got to be respect for the Word of God. Thirdly, You've got to be clean in your priesthood if you're going to learn the meat of the word. We just saw Paul said, you can't handle anything but milk when you're in carnality. And that's what most pastors provide, milk. They know their congregations are carnal. They're not going to have a silent time of prayer before church. That's too weird. They're not going to teach their congregations how to confess their sins biblically. They're going to teach a story out of the gospel. And that's the milk of the word. 
So if you really want to function in gap, you need to learn how to operate clean from your priesthood. 1 John 1, 9 is the answer. Humility. And every one of us has to learn how to humble ourselves under God's word and learn. And then finally, concentration, which comes over time. You have to have strict academic concentration. But this is still left load mechanics and it doesn't even mean that you're going to get anything out of it. It just means you're going to listen and learn. But we've got to learn how to actually make this thing functional. And that brings the last stage of left load mechanics. And it is the faith transfer of Gnosis. So Gnosis doctrine is academic knowledge. In the left lobe, it's only understood, it's not believed, until you get to that volition gate, that's point F. And you say, you know what? I'm taking that for my own. I believe it. I believe God's going to protect me and he'll never lead me anywhere that, that I am out of his reach. That his, uh, the Bible says, he, he hovers over us like a ma hen with her chicks. Uh, I, I like, uh, when I'm out uh, running, uh, I was out running alongside some cliffs the other day just having some good old time in the mountains and uh, I remembered that uh, verse in Psalms. He makes my feet as sure-footed as a deer along mountaintops. And uh, even the one Satan wanted to quote to Jesus when he stood upon the uh, temple wall, his angels shall uphold thee to keep thee from falling. And see, when you've got those promises... If they're just academic, they don't mean nothing. But when you got them over here in the right lobe, you live a life of power because there's no fear. And you see, you can't go anywhere where God doesn't love you and doesn't protect you and he's not with you. See, that's what it means to have a faith transfer. And that's what it, it comes from being a cowardly soldier who's trembling and falling apart on the battlefield to someone who is full of valor, who's full of dignity and honor. That's a difference between gnosis and epinosis. And there are so many Christians who have maybe academic knowledge of some Bible verses, but have never brought it on home and made it ap applicable. So in the left lobe, it's just academic. It's just over there. It really doesn't get applied. So, the perceptive lobe is called the noose. That's the left lobe of the soul. Generally translated, mind. It's a process area for all types of knowledge, whether it's doctrine or even human knowledge. In our study, it's the staging area for Bible doctrine. This lobe is where you store academic knowledge. Gnosis means you don't have to agree or disagree. You simply understand it. The danger is to let it hang there. And any doctrine that you understand and hangs in your left lobe can never be applied. In other words, you've got to believe it. Jesus Christ will never leave you or forsake you. You've got to believe it. I love it. 
There's 6,000 promises in the Word of God. None of them mean anything until you mix them with faith. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, shall fear no evil. Who's there? Jesus Christ. His rod and his staff. They comfort me. I mean, you've got to believe it. And there's a, once you believe it, friend, there's no storm in this life you can't walk through. There's no vicissitudes in life that you can't endure. There's no adversity that you can't approach. But without it, you're nothing. You fall apart. So don't let it hang up in the left lobe is the idea. Let's bring it on over to the right lobe. What happens when you believe it? What happens when you get the faith transfer? The word heart is translated from the word cardia. It's not the pump station that we understand in our chest. But in fact, it is the precordial frontal lobe. Right lobe of the soul's mentality. First of all, the heart has compartments. The first compartment is a frame of reference. That's where we build doctrine on doctrine. And there are some more advanced doctrines that you have to learn basic doctrine before you can get the advanced version. So you start out with basic math and then you move on. I think if you begin to learn <clears throat> Bible doctrine, you ought, the first thing you ought to do is learn eternal security. And along with that, you learn the essence of God. But that gives you a foundation to stand on, to build from, and you start up and go up with basic doctrines from there. Secondly, you have a memory center. That's where you warehouse maybe those promises we were talking about. You may even have concepts in there. So inside the memory center is designed by God so that you can store up the Word of God and warehouse it for time of need. The problem is the memory center empties itself and you have to continually keep it tuned up. The rate of learning must exceed the rate of forgetting. Thirdly, there's a vocabulary storage in there. may be words that you don't understand that you have to build up. When I first started listening to the colonel, I had an old Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, and I had to hit pause. What in the world is he talking about? And a lot of times I could find it in there. He was such a scholar, had such a wide vocabulary, that it, uh, for me, a farm boy, I had a lot of learning to do. And... He come out with that phrase, post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. What? That was just a fancy way of saying getting your head screwed on straight. But it was a vocabulary term. And you had to learn it. And uh, so there are words associated with learning doctrine, just like divine dinosphere. We're learning cosmic dinospheres one and two. You have to learn these terms in order to keep going and categorical store vocabulary storage is where you're going to learn them. And then finally, not finally, but next, you'll have a categorical storage. And that may be where you store doctrines like the doctrine of death. There's eight different kinds of death in the Bible. Judgments. Laying on of hands. There's three different kinds of laying on of hands in the Bible. So all the categories of the Bible 
you have a categorical storage for those. Then you have a conscience. What is good, bad, right, or wrong? It's a, it's a real tragedy that people uh, today don't even know the Ten Commandments. And a lot of people killing each other out here out of hate. Uh, and they go to prison and say, yeah, he's a bad dude because he killed three people or whatever. Well, look, won't, won't your mom and daddy teach you about thou shalt do no murder? Love your neighbor as yourself around the dinner table. And it would see the whole, our whole nation would change if we, we taught the concept that a human life is, uh, has great value in the eyes of God. He paid the most you could ever pay for a soul, and we ought not uh, take it in our own hands. And stealing and this kind of thing. You see, the conscience can be formed around the Word of God. And the more of the Word of God you learn, the more your conscience is changed to divine norms and standards. And um, I was just looking at my notes earlier <clears throat> over by Ephesians, which will, in chapter 5, which will be there in a couple of years maybe, we're going to get into marriage, category marriage. And I had here when I was reading, I was listening to a tape, it says, a wife with patronage to God will have patronage to husband. In other words, a woman who salutes God, who has a relationship with Jesus Christ and loves His Word, is going to have no problem saluting her husband. You see that? You take a woman that loves God and honors God, she's going to honor her husband. In the conscience, see, norms and standards are changed. You take a woman who doesn't know anything about God, doesn't know anything about the Word of God, who is she saluting? Herself. I am my authority. I know how to get the most out of this. There's lots of ways the conscience has changed when you begin to learn the Word of God. Then you have momentum. That's the launching pad. That's where you make the application of Bible doctrine to life experience. Momentum and wisdom. Momentum is actually the compartment. I don't even know that we haven't taken that out of the most recent ones, but that's where you shovel the coal in the fire and keep the train rolling, and wisdom is the launching pad. Okay, so the point of the Christian way of life is to get truth in your soul and apply it to your life, and wisdom is the application. Could you say that it would be good for Christians to learn the Word of God and apply it to their life? I would say yes. I would say if I had, if I had a young Christian in here and I'd say, well, now look, you're born again, you're headed to heaven. And God doesn't care about your religious experiences. He doesn't care about you walking the aisle, getting baptized. He doesn't care about your Christian fellowship. Here's the point of your Christian way of life. God wants you to learn His Word and make application to your life. See, that shells out a lot of dust and debris. And if they, if they left my presence and they never heard another word from me again, they got some pretty clear directions. Wisdom is the application of Bible doctrine to life experience. And it has more value than you could ever know. You want to live a life of power? Wisdom. Want to live a life of, of purpose, meaning, and definition? Wisdom. 
So they're the right lobe mechanics. Wisdom is where the rubber meets the road. So, wisdom on the launching pad means one thing. You are a doer of the word. So we've got 6A and 6B here. Getting doctrine from the left lobe to the right lobe is accomplished by faith, which transfers doctrine out of the left lobe as gnosis into the cardia as epinosis, full knowledge. There must be doctrine in the frame of reference. Well, I've got this on the next page. There must be doctrine in the frame of reference. You build doctrine on doctrine. That's why you have to learn basic doctrine first. Then by building your vocabulary. Then from building your vocabulary, you begin to get concepts or categories. Your norms and standards begin to change and they comply with divine norms and standards. All of these feed into the launching pad. That's where you become a doer of the word. A doer of the word isn't a worker. A doer of the word is a believer with doctrine on the launching pad. Now, I want to tell you about making application of Bible doctrine to life experience. There's two things that happen. Once the be for one thing, the believer is benefited. You are benefited when you apply doctrine to your life. You are benefited. And secondly, God is glorified. When you use His Word to overcome in your life, God is glorified. So you are benefited and God is glorified. What's wrong with that? Nothing. So point seven is the last point. It has lots of sub points underneath it. We got eight minutes and we can do it. There is a grace provision for learning Bible doctrine. The formation and preservation of the canon of Scripture. And that takes up the doctrine of canonicity and the doctrine of inspiration. I love to read, uh, read the stories about how they found all the different scriptures. It's wonderful. About the kid throwing the rock at the dead, dead sea and he heard a clank and a break and it ended up being the Dead Sea Scrolls. He threw it up into a cave and he heard glass break, a vase break. It was one of the, one of the best copies of scripture we ever had it was right there and then when they they had some tombs that they were uh looking for treasure in and in uh, in egypt and it had all these crocodiles out of the river there now crocodiles and they were they were stacked in this catacombs there big tomb and they had to move all these crocodiles out of the way to get in there to supposedly find the treasure. But they found out that what the crocodiles were stuffed with were copies of the Word of God. Amazing, the real treasure was inside the croc. So all the different tools that we have to be able to understand the original languages, all supplied in grace. Secondly, a classroom for learning doctrine is called the local church. It's not designed for raising money, strawberry festivals, and fellowship. The local church was designed to be a classroom with one teacher and students without portfolio. Thirdly, the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher is divinely authorized communicator, and there never was and never will be a pastor who earned or deserved the right to speak. 
The gift is sovereignly bestowed to many types of males. No woman had the gift. We're going to learn that in the rest of our chapter here. While females are give, given the gift of teacher, which communicates doctrine inside the local church, the Bible tells tells us that no woman should have authority over a man inside the church. Point D, the priesthood of the believer for privacy and reception. If you're really going to take in doctrine on an objective basis, you must have the privacy of your priesthood to do it, and that means there's no one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. I might bully you. I might interrogate you. I might put the white light in your face. I might try to cram it down your throat. And see, that means freedom when you have a classroom. E, the indwelling of the Spirit for the function of gap. We saw 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. Also 1 John 2, 27. We know the believer must be operating clean in the priesthood for God the Holy Spirit to function as teacher. Point F, the grace provision for the filling of the Spirit through the rebound technique. The bronze labor of the church age, 1 John 1, 9, And we don't earn or deserve forgiveness on a daily basis, that's for sure, but God gave it freely. G, the human spirit, as a first target for gap, Job 32, 8, 1 Corinthians 2, 12. I like to call the human spirit the divine transponder organ because it both receives and communicates. And without it, we have no correspondence with God. Point H is our verse uh, we're talking about in 1 Timothy 2. Establishment protects freedom. And so in grace, the provision of the laws of divine establishment whereby the nation protects the freedom and the privacy of the local church. Point I, the anatomy of grace whereby certain non-meritorious functions of the body Make it possible to think and concentrate. If you took everything that you've kept to keep your body tuned up and ready to go, it'd be a lot of things. Lots of food, lots of water, lots of supplements, lots of rest. All grace. And that's as far as we're going to take the doctrine of gap. Well, I'm certainly thankful for the doctrine of gap, for it's the only way that I made any progress in my Christian life. I knew very little about the Bible at all before I got a hold of a categorical notebook and a tape and began to sit down and learn. And that's where I got my questions answered. And I think a lot of you did too. And that's the reason we're all here today. I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this evening. I want to pray with you. Let's bow our heads together. 
Our Father God in heaven, we thank you that you have made a provision for us to learn your word and grow. We thank you that it's such a dynamic thing to be able to have truth in our souls, make application to our daily lives and be benefited. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name, amen.